What if the key to preventing and even reversing heart disease, a condition that remains the leading cause of death worldwide, lies not in medication, surgery, or genetics, but right on your plate? In today's episode, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our incredible guest whom I admire very much, none other than Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn Jr., a renowned physician, researcher, and a true pioneer in the field of plant-based nutrition. Dr. Esselstyn has spent decades researching and proving that a whole food plant-based diet has the potential to prevent and even reverse chronic conditions like heart disease, diabetes, and more. His groundbreaking work at the Cleveland Clinic, coupled with the best-selling book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, has made him a leading authority in this revolutionary approach to health. But Dr. Esselstyn's journey isn't anything but typical. He's not only a world-class physician, but also an Olympic gold medalist in rowing from the 1956 Melbourne Games, bringing the same dedication and determination to the field of medicine that he once brought to his athletic career. His research has challenged conventional thinking about heart disease treatment and empowered countless individuals to take control of their health through nutrition. In this episode, we will explore the foods which Dr. Esselstyn recommends eliminating for optimal health, why nitric oxide plays a vital role in preventing disease, and how something as simple as chewing leafy greens can have a profound impact on your well-being. We will also discuss the dangers of processed vegan foods, the importance of educating healthcare professionals about plant-based nutrition, and the role of cholesterol in heart disease. So get ready for a conversation with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, packed with powerful insights and practical advice that can help you take control of your health and build a healthier future. As a bonus, we will share with you his favorite meal and his definition of happiness. You are listening to Health, Happiness, and Planet podcast, where we explore different ways to boost our well-being, live a more fulfilling life, and protect our planet. Join me as I chat with inspiring people and professionals from all over the world, uncovering strategies for improving our lifestyles and nurturing our precious planet. I am Juan. And this podcast is proudly brought to you by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, my digital training company that cares about your career and personal development. I am passionate about making the world a better place. So if you share my enthusiasm, this show is for you. Together, we can steer towards a healthier, happier life while leaving a positive footprint on our beautiful earth. Join me as we explore how being healthy, happy, and caring for our planet are all connected. Hello, Dr. Esselstyn, and welcome to the Health, Happiness, and Planet podcast. It's so great to have you here. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you for the uh, invitation. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. And I'm so, so grateful to have you here on the podcast because now with my wife, we are plant-based since the last 10 years, and it has really changed our lives. And the main driver from our change of mindset from going to plant-based was because of Forks Over Knives. And then we got to see uh, you on the show. Then we got also information from Dr. Michael Greger, from Dr. Neil Barnard. Then we read about the China study from Colin Campbell. And like this, we just gathered more and more information. And at the end, there was no other option but to go plant-based. <laughs> And uh, we're very grateful for all the work that you have done uh, all these years together with your family, not only yourself, but also your son, Rip. He's also done a lot for the community and a lot for the plant-based, I would say, direction so that people are aware of putting things into your mouth, how that can really change the way how your health is going to be for the future. So my first question for you is, how did you get to where you are today? Well, it was probably back in 1979 when I was chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force that I became quite disillusioned with the fact that for no matter how many women I was doing breast surgery, I was doing absolutely nothing for the next unsuspecting victim. And uh, this really challenged me to sort of do a bit of global review. And it was really quite striking to see that there were other cultures where breast cancer rates were 30 and 40 times less frequent than the United States. And in 
1950s in rural rural Japan, breast cancer rates were very infrequent, and yet as soon as the Japanese women would migrate to the United States by the second and third generation, they now had the same rate of breast cancer as their Caucasian counterpart. Perhaps even more provocative was the fact that in 1958, in the entire nation of Japan, how many autopsy-proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18. 18 in the entire nation. That's the most, most mind-blowing public health figure I think I've encountered. And yet by 1978, 20 years later, they were up to 137, which still pales in comparison to the 28,000 who were going to die in this country from prostate cancer this year. And it was along about this time that uh, during this review, I began to feel that there would be more bang for the buck if we could look at cardiovascular disease, because I was constantly encountering cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually non-existent. And it just seemed to me that there would be more of a reward. If we could get people to eat to save their heart, they would markedly diminish the likelihood of having the common Western cancers of breast, prostate, colon, and pancreatic. So that was the uh, the background. And when uh, you just can't utter that as a suggestion, you really have to make it count by doing research. And so that was in 1985 that I started our first small program on a group of patients who were seriously ill with cardiovascular disease to see if we couldn't get them to eat plant-based and diminish the likelihood of any disease progression. And we occasionally saw striking examples of disease reversal. Wow. And probably even more effective than any pill or medicine out there. Well, there are no, there are no drugs. There are no pills. There are no stents. There are no bypass surgeries that treat the causation of the illness. That is the key. I mean, there's been a basic covenant of trust since the days of Hippocrates that whenever possible, the caregiver will share with the patient what is the causation of the illness. And sadly, today, in cardiovascular medicine, that's not being done. So true. For myself, if I think about my journey, or when I become an adult, that was about 25 years ago when I, when I was then 18, I had just a regular, I would say, standard American diet, just eating a lot of meat, a lot of dairy. And, and I could really notice how after a couple of years, when I was getting closer to my 30s, that I had a lot of ailments. I had joint pain. I had allergies. I had high cholesterol, extremely high cholesterol. So at the end, I was taking medication for reducing cholesterol. I was taking medication to reduce my high blood pressure taking medication for my allergies. Then I had side effects. I had to take medication for that. So I was thinking, okay, wait a minute. I'm just about my 30s. It cannot be that I'm taking so many pills for so many things. There must be something wrong what I'm doing here. So my wife and I, we, we decided to flip everything and to change to a plant-based diet just to try it out. And within three months, I was able to reduce my cholesterol levels from 360 down to 180. That was within three months time. My allergies almost disappeared. It took me about a year to get rid of my allergies. My blood pressure was in normal levels. I, I was feeling much, much better. And at the end of the day, I think it took about two years and I went down, I'm not sure in pounds, but in kilos, it's about 25 kilos that I reduced weight. So I was almost getting to becoming overweight. And all of that just got better just because I changed the way how I was eating. I, I let go of the meat, I let go of the dairy, and just focused on eating things that came from our Mother Earth. That was the turning point for my health. I mean, now I'm getting close to my 50s, and I never felt so energetic like I do today. When I was 18, I thought, well, I'm at 10 points in energy from 10 points. But now when I think back, I'm like, whoa, those 10 points feel more like a 7 or a 6 because now I know what 10 points feels like. <laughs> And therefore, I think one of the eye openers from my side was really to read your books and also to see Forks Over Knives. And all of that really opens a lot of questions that people will ask and to really make the right questions, hopefully, and the right decisions to see, is it what I'm doing today with my standard American diet or any other diets out there? Is it really doing me good? And therefore, I think the data and the facts that you have, it overweighs uh, almost anything. Because usually when you look at social media, you look at internet, you see everybody saying all kinds of things. Oh, eggs are suddenly good for you, or dairy is good for you, or meat is good for you. But there's no background. The amount of evidence that we have today on plant-based outweighs much more of all the other things that people are just saying in social media. 
how is your opinion on that? Well, how come people sometimes do not realize that there's so much information already since so many years collected in the plant-based uh, nutrition and how that can affect our health? Well, it's, it's, it is changing because uh, I would say 36 years ago when I started, or close to 40 years, uh, only about 2% of people were eating plant-based or were vegetarian and so forth. I understand now that the latest uh, information suggests that it's closer to 18%. Wow. So there are a subtle number going forward. And uh, people, are, are, I think, are recognizing the benefits because, for instance, the movie Forks Over Knives had an enormous, enormous impact. It didn't convert everybody, obviously, but it was, it was well done, and it uh, clearly established the power of, uh, of whole food uh, plant-based nutrition. Uh, sadly, though, today, what we have to do is we have to get it converted into schools. Every five years, the United States government puts forth a suggestion about how the public should eat. They'll give a, a food plan, and uh, it contains all the foods that are going to injure you. I mean, it's got oil and dairy and meat. So what really has to happen, we have to take a close look at the, uh, the government and how it makes this suggestion. And there, I think right now that there is a new movie coming out, They're Killing Us, yeah. referring to the government suggestions. Now, that's very powerful because the United States Agriculture Committee that makes this information available to the public is totally conflicted. The president and the members of the committee are all members of the Egg Board, the Cattlemen's Association, the Dairy Association, and uh, all of these enormous conflicts. Anyway, it's, I think it's by 2030, it's anticipated that cardiovascular medicine will cost us over $800 billion, wow. which is uh, very serious. Yeah, definitely. Uh, wow, that's definitely a, a statistic to think about. And, but most people have tr traditionally have been brought up, and the, of course, the advertising of processed foods and meat uh, is enormous, mm. enormous. Yeah. And what about the studies that doctors usually go through, like the general doctor? If I think back, like 10, 20 years, usually one has somehow the feeling that they do not really know much about nutrition and diet. And do you think that's changing nowadays, that they're also putting into the program when one becomes a doctor? No, it's still a, it's still a very a pitiful mess because there's very few medical schools that are to put an emphasis on nutrition. And even worse, for instance, in the profession of cardiology, the cardiologists themselves recognize that they're getting very little, if any, any information on nutrition. Let me give you an example that happened just last week because I, I got a letter from a physician whom I had seen a year and a half ago. And he was in his early 70s. And a year and a half ago, he had a heart attack. Right? And he was overweight. And he was somewhat diabetic, pre-diabetic. But after he had his catheterization, his cardiologist said, you have to have bypass surgery. And he said, wait a minute. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. I'm going to try to do this with an aggressive plant-based approach, which he adapted after our, our visit. And he wanted to give me a follow-up. So a year, and, and by the way, at that time, there was one lesion that was in, uh, his left anterior descending coronary artery was 95% blocked. Well, he had a repeat catheterization two weeks ago. So it was a year and a half. What formerly was 95% blocked is now 5% blocked. Wow. But now the, the question that comes up is because he's been feeling better ever since he started this. Did it take a year and a half? That's when the test was done. Suppose we had done it at one year. Suppose we'd done it at half. You know, yeah. everybody probably has a, a different pace at which they are able to halt or reverse their disease. But that's such a powerful message. The other message that I think is so important for people to know is that even though they don't think they have disease, they do have the disease. For example... When we look back historically at the Korean conflict in 1950-51, when we autopsy those young, those young soldiers who died in combat, average age 20, 80% of them already had gross evidence of coronary artery disease that you could see without a microscope, not enough, 
yet for a disease enough to give them cardiac events. But that same study was then repeated in 1999, this time young women and men between the ages of 17 and 34 who had died of accidents, homicides, and suicides were autopsied. Now the disease is ubiquitous. Everybody had it. So when somebody says, why should, why should I change? I don't have, yes, you don't have symptoms yet. But if you're over 17 and you've been eating the Western diet, whether it's in Spain or the United States, you've got the disease. Yeah. What do you have to look forward to? Well, you can maybe you don't have it quite yet, but you can get a stroke or you can have your heart attack or maybe you'll have something like dementia. Wow. What is so powerful also what I just uh, was able to identify from what you mentioned is that it's not only avoiding chronic diseases in the future, it's actually reversing it. So that's, I think, something that people really need to have that eye opener to say, look, even if you have it today, and even if you already had a bad diet in your past, this can actually reverse it. And there is, as we said, no pill that's going to make those kind of effects without side effects. I'll, uh, I'll give you one more example. The oldest patient that I ever started with was 87, and he was rather frail. And he had been told he had to have bypass surgery, and he felt that he would not tolerate it, that the bypass surgery, he would die from it. So he decided he wanted to go plant-based, and nice fellow, and he would call usually once or twice a year to, to let us know how he was progressing. He was in California. Last year, when he made his call to us, he asked to speak to my wife, and he wanted to speak to Anne because he wanted to get from her... Uh, almost a hundred recipes. <laughs> so, uh, and then Ann asked him, that sounds pretty special, what, what's going on? And he said, well, I'm celebrating my 100th birthday. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so this year when he called, he said he just called because he wanted to remind us that he was now 101. Amazing. <laughs> That is such a good story. It's not like about getting to a certain age. It's about how do you get to that age and how do you feel? What's the quality of your life when you are at a certain age? Because I think right. when I look at a lot of people, they are maybe already in their 60s, 70s, but they have been already suffering since the last 10, 15 years in their life. I'm thinking, what kind of life is this? Do you really want to suffer till you're 100 or do you want to thrive? Do you want to feel better? you want to feel good in your body? And that's the realization that some people do it maybe at the beginning of their life and others maybe a little bit later. But I'm, I'm so glad to hear those stories and statistics. And from your side, you're promoting a lot of this type of uh, plant-based eating and also through your the Esselstyn Foundation. What is that usually the resistance that people have? Is it because they say, I love milk? Or is it because they say, that's the way how I used to eat in the past? What do you think is the main source of resistance that they have to make that change? A total lack of education. A total lack of education. For instance, I still conduct once every six weeks, approximately, a uh, intensive five and a half hour seminar for patients who are self-referred who have cardiovascular disease. And I think the, the thing that's exciting about this is that we are going to be sure that they understand the causation of the illness. For instance, you're talking with somebody and you're talking about plant-based nutrition and they're using all kinds of reasons and excuses not to. But the one that's missing is what we teach every one of the patients. All experts would agree that where this disease has its inception, its onset, its beginning is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian of our blood vessels, which happens to be that delicate innermost lining called the endothelium. And it is the endothelium that is manufacturing a truly magic molecule of gas called nitric oxide, which is responsible for the salvation, preservation, and protection of all of our blood vessels because of its remarkable functions. For example, Nitric oxide will keep all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly, like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. For example, when you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, the arteries to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thickened, stiff, or inflamed 
and protect us from getting high blood pressure or hypertension. Number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing any blockages or plaques. So literally, everybody on the planet Earth who has cardiovascular disease has their disease because by now in the previous decades, they have so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into an absolute train wreck that they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from having blockages or plaque. So literally, the key here is this. The good news, actually, is that this is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to understand that never, never, ever again are they to pass through their lips a single morsel that is going to further injure an already train-wrecked endothelium because then the endothelium will recover, Mm -hmm. make enough nitric oxide so we can not only halt disease progression, but we often see elements of disease reversal. So right there is the nucleus of what we're teaching these people. They have to understand that the causation of their illness is they have destroyed their endothelial capacity to make nitric oxide. You can look at it as a nitric oxide deficiency disease. Yeah. And the exciting thing is that you can turn the, turn this around when restoring the endothelium and also embracing the newer research that shows us that mankind has an alternate pathway for making additional nitric oxide. I think that's something that not many people have heard so far. No, because that's how many, yeah, I mean, any, <laughs> you can see it, you can talk to anybody who's over 17 or 30 years of age and say, I understand your passion for eating those Western foods, but I'm already looking at somebody who has got disease. You do. We know this from the data. If you've been eating Western diet, you've got the disease. Are there anybody in Spain who ever has dementia? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is there anybody in Spain who ever has a stroke? A number of them, yes. <laughs> anybody in Spain who ever, ever has coronary artery heart disease? Yep, they're full of them. All the hospitals, yeah. Do you want to talk about the new method for making nitric oxide, which is yep. the newer research? Sure. Yep. You see, if, what do we want people to eliminate? First of all, what are the foods that every time they pass our lips, we injure the endothelial cells? They are, one. Any drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a chip, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. Oil injures endothelial cells, as does anything that is animal protein, meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs. Also, anything that is dairy, milk cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt. Also, we don't like sugary foods, cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, and honey. Also, we want to eliminate peanuts, peanut butter, nut butters, cashew sauce, and avocado. And lastly, coffee with caffeine. Yeah. Now, what are you going to eat? You're going to eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels, 101 different types of legumes, lentils, and beans, all these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, white potatoes, sweet potatoes, and some fruit. Now, the reason I made the transition about a decade ago was because of the information that the endothelial production of nitric oxide is age-dependent. For example, you never heard of a boy or a girl at age eight having a heart attack. No. Right. They have nitric oxide coming out of their ears, but by the time they're beautifully healthy at age 50, they now have 50% of the nitric oxide they have when they were age 25. And by the time you're 80, you've lost 70%. So the changes I made were two. One was a greater stimulation of the endothelial production of nitric oxide. And number two, was we embrace the newer research that shows us that mankind has a method of making nitric oxide that we haven't before appreciated. So, here we go. Well, I need a patient with heart disease to chew six times a day 
a green leafy vegetable, approximately one third of a cup, after it has first been steamed or boiled five and a half to six minutes so it's nice and tender. Mm -hmm. Then you must anoint it with several drops of a beautiful, either balsamic or rice vinegar. Why? Because research has shown us that the acetic acid of those vinegars can restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme. Okay. That enzyme is contained within the endothelial cell and responsible for making nitric oxide. So, you're going to chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich, that's three, mid-afternoon, four, dinner time, five, and of course I adore it when you have that evening snack of arugula or kale. <laughs> Second benefit from chewing the green leafy vegetable, it restores the capacity of your bone marrow to once again make the endothelial progenitor cell, which will replace our senescent, injured, worn out endothelial cells. The third benefit, when you're chewing a green leafy vegetable, you are chewing a nitrate. As you chew the nitrate, it is going to mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that resides in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. Those bacteria are going to reduce the nitrate that you've been chewing to nitrite. When you swallow the nitrite, it is your own gastric acid, which is now going to further reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide, which can enter your nitric oxide pool. So think about it, what you're doing with minimal expense, no side effects, <laughs> all day long. Yeah. Dawn to dusk, morning to night, wow. you are absolutely restoring nitric oxide, the very molecule the deficiency of which gave you this disease in the first place. Now, there is a caveat to this. Toothpaste with fluoride, public drinking water with fluoride, and mouthwash will injure the beneficial bacteria in your mouth. And I do not like antacids because antacids will reduce your gastric acidity and you will be unable to reduce the nitrite to more nitric oxide. Now, the top six vegetables would be kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. Excellent. Now, if you want to hear the whole list, the whole list goes like this. Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green, beet greens, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, arugula, and asparagus. Wow. And the reason I go through that with you, you have to understand how powerful whole food plant-based nutrition is for restoring and maintaining your memory. Yeah, amazing, amazing. That's so good. Time for a quick break to mention that the sponsor of this podcast is Wave Business Excellence Footprint, a digital training company deeply committed to your career development, personal growth, and the well-being of our precious planet. Dive into a wealth of knowledge with over 20 courses available on our website, www.wave-bef.com tailored for both managers and employees aspiring to become tomorrow's leaders. I realized after I went plant-based how much diversity that's out there. Now when I think back, I'm like, I was so monotonous when I was eating meat and potatoes and rice because I always had either chicken with rice, chicken with a little bit of vegetables, maybe a little bit of salad next to it. But there was always that combination of chicken or, or meat or turkey or fish and then either potatoes or rice. But now that we are plant-based and all of those ingredients that you just mentioned right now, it's such an, I would say, divine sortiment that we have out there that's given to us from Mother Nature. And even my taste buds, they have changed so much that when I eat now all of these different things in the plant world, it tastes so much better than it used to be before. And therefore, now my next question, and if somebody does have some fat in their diet, where should the fats come from? Well, there's fat in everything. This is not a no-fat diet. This is a, it may be low-fat, mm -hmm. but uh, there's fat in grain, right? Yep. There's fat in legumes, there's fat in lentils, there's fat in vegetables, there's fat in potatoes. You're not going to be fat deficient, although if you're worried about omega-3, you can always take flaxseed meal, several tablespoons at breakfast, or you can also use chia seeds, and green leafy vegetables will contribute. Perfect, perfect. If one follows that plant-based diet, the way how you described it, is there any supplement that one would need? Because I know that a lot of people are always concerned about B12. I would look at uh, B12 for sure. Okay. Maybe D3, vitamin D3. 
And what about um, iron? Because I know when, when I speak with somebody who is not vegan or plant-based, they always think about, oh, what about your iron intake? Is it true that iron comes from the dark leafy greens? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. funny. This is not an iron deficient diet. <laughs> That's right. If a person is in a plant-based diet and still has a bit higher cholesterol levels, what could be the reason that they still have a higher cholesterol level? Have you seen such cases? Well, everybody has a different thermostat on their liver. If I take a thousand patients, but let's say none of them are taking any statins, okay? Yeah. But they're totally following our, our program absolutely correctly. There will be some who will have a total cholesterol of 102. One, some will be 140, 160, 180, 200, 220. Everybody is going to be different because of their thermostat on their liver. Many patients will have a nice reduction in their cholesterol. But the main thing here is not so much to be hung up and worried about the number. It always comes down to the food as far as the health of the vessel. Mm. No number is going to injure your endothelium. What injures your endothelium is the food that you're eating. Okay. I'm not saying you get not to completely ignore cholesterol or, or apple B or LP small a, but it seems to me if you are eating in a way that your inflammation is absolutely so low that you are, in essence, building an endothelial fortress. Okay. So even if you have a few extra molecules of cholesterol coursing through your bloodstream, they should not be able to hear you. And you see this in patients who have familial hypercholesterolemia. Some of them just absolutely doing fine. Okay, good to know. That leads me now to my next question, which is about the uh, nutritionists, because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to just go and contact my nutritionist and see what they're going to tell me. And when I look in the Internet to see what type of nutritionists are out there, some are plant based, some are going the direction paleo, all kind of different names what they have nowadays. But what really strikes me is that how come these people get the certification of being a nutritionist, but they're so far away from the plant-based world? <laughs> what do you think is one of those root causes? Well, it depends upon usually the education that the dietitian gets. It was dependent upon who was financing the school. Yeah. And if it's the meat industry and the dairy industry and oil industry financing nutritionist education in their school, it's no great surprise that they are not really understanding about the whole food plant-based nutrition as a movement. But yeah. it's so different. Back when I started in 1985, I could count on one hand the number of doctors who were interested in plant-based nutrition. Now, it's easily, there are hundreds yeah. going. <laughs> yeah. That's good to hear. But some of them are not, uh, oh, I think I'll, how I say this, the reason that my program succeeds where others may fail, nobody else is as mean as I am. <laughs> I hate failure. Yeah. Therefore, we don't, we don't make exceptions. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's key also what you said previously that education is the main thing that people really have to uh, focus on because if they read your books and they look at even the way of cooking at home, yeah, because many people have like that barrier to think, now I have the knowledge, but how am I going to put that into action? And then there's also the books that you provide to show them, look, we also can show you the recipes that you have in order to go the right direction. So I think the education is the first step to opening eyes. And once you know, well, then it's actually hard to unknow. Yeah, because yeah. once you know it, then it's just hopefully one plants the seed where at some point of time, somebody might not take maybe the decision right away, but it's processing somewhere. And maybe two years later, three years later, they get some kind of illness and then they will think about what they saw, or what they read from your book, and then they will start testing new options yeah. for their health. So when I think about... 10 years ago when I went vegan, there were not so many restaurants, there were not so many products out there that could help us do that transition. And I thought that that was actually a downside. Today, if you go to the supermarket, you see all these aisles of different vegan cheese and vegan uh, burger patties and, and processed uh, vegan uh, nuggets made out of soy. And now I think, well, actually, 
today it's so much easier to do the transition to vegan, but it does not really necessarily mean that you're going to be healthier. I think that a lot of people who then switch to say, hey, I've done vegan for a month. I weigh the same. I'm just as unhealthy. And I think that that's the danger that there's so much processed food in the supermarket that they really need to watch out. Purchase foods that don't have any label, no ingredient. Yeah, exactly. And no barcodes. <laughs> yeah. So to summarize everything that we have just covered in this podcast, uh, you could probably confirm from all the data you have seen, all of the examples you have seen, all the people around you, and even the patients that you've had, that going plant-based will definitely have an improvement on your health. Yeah. And it will also be able to reverse a lot with health issues. And it will also bring a higher quality of life when one gets older. And I think when one is young, usually one thinks, oh, I'm young, you know, I have so much ahead of me, you don't really think about it. But I think it's so important that we invest already at the beginning in our health so that we can be much, much longer in a healthier state once we get older. And therefore, what would be your recommendation for the younger generations today when they're still a little bit hesitant? What could be like a key message you would like to leave them with? Well, the key here is to be educated. And if they can become familiar with the studies that I've shared with you today, the studies that show that, for instance, eating a Western diet by the age of 17 to 34, and females who have died of accidents, homicides, and suicides, that early coronary disease is now ubiquitous. They already, so if they're wanting to make the argument, if they're closing in on 17, they're already getting disease not only in their heart, but they can get it with the carotid arteries to the brain. And uh, the key, I think, is when they begin to appreciate, that's what swung it for our, our children. We have four children and we have 10 grandchildren, all of whom are now are totally plant-based. That is fantastic. That's really leading by example. <laughs> yeah. And now I have two final fun questions. And what is your favorite meal? Beans and rice. Okay. Sounds almost like a Cuban dish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, very good. Beans and rice. I, I also love that. Yeah. And what is your definition of happiness? Yeah, uh, my happiness is me. I have a uh, feeling that really in the near future, there will be a seismic revolution in health. And that seismic revolution will never come about through the invention of another drug or pill or stent or a bypass. Really, the, the seismic revolution will come about when we in the profession have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle, and most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that will empower the public to absolutely eliminate chronic illness. That's a nice vision to have, and I will also do the best from my part to be pushing that further, also from over here, from this side of the world in Europe, and I'm based in Spain, so I'm, I'm also happy to promote all of this knowledge to everybody. And um, this podcast, we are in 15 different platforms. So we are really uh, trying to push that knowledge out there to, and to show, you know, that we don't have to reinvent the wheel again. Yeah, all what we need to know already exists. We do have the data, we have the evidence, and we just need to learn about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Juan. So thank you very much, Dr. Esselstyn. Thank you again for all the things that you're doing. One final word regarding your foundation. Could you give us a, just a high overview? What is the mission of your foundation? It is a public charity and it will help us do this kind of thing really uh, for others, especially the, those who are underserved. And uh, this has been very exciting as a way to sort of broaden the message. It doesn't cost anything to the people who are receiving the message. <laughs> But we are just delighted to put the message together and make it available, as I said, especially to those who are underserved. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. I'll be putting that into the show notes. So anybody who's interested, I'll put in the link to the foundation on the show notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Well, Dr. Esselstyn, thank you so much for the time that you invested on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope this conversation with Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn left you feeling informed, inspired, and ready to take charge of your health. His deep knowledge and passion for plant-based nutrition reminds us of the incredible power we have to take control of our health, starting with the food on our plates. Dr. Esselstyn has shown that heart disease, one of the most devastating chronic conditions, 
can not only be prevented, but even reversed through mindful dietary choices. From eliminating harmful foods to harnessing the benefits of leafy greens and nitric oxide, the insights he shared offer a roadmap to better health and longevity. It is clear that the future of health is in our hands and Dr. Esselstyn's message of hope and empowerment is a reminder that it's never too late to make changes that can transform your life. If today's episode resonated with you, I encourage you to explore more of Dr. Esselstyn's work, including his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, and consider adopting some of his plant-based recommendations into your own life. Additionally, I also highly recommend you to watch the documentary called Forks Over Knives, where you will also find Dr. Esselstyn. Thank you for joining us today. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with someone who might benefit from Dr. Esselstyn's invaluable insights. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a review and stay tuned for more inspiring conversations that empower you to live your healthiest life. Until next time, take care of your health and keep making choices that nourish your body and soul. Big hugs, everyone.